Well, Father God, we thank you so much for tonight, God. Lord, we thank you for the reassurance that we have, God, as believers, Lord. Lord, that we are heaven-bound. God, we glorify you tonight. Lord, we pray, God, that the truth, God, the, uh, Lord, the word that is going to be given tonight, Lord, Lord, that we would have open ears to hear, that we would have, Lord, just hearts, Lord, to receive and minds to understand, God, Lord, what you have, what you really want to speak to us tonight, God. Lord, uh, let there not be any false communication or, or any just uh, anything that would, Lord, mess up our understanding, God. But let us be able to understand clearly, God, what you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So welcome to Wednesday night once again. Um, those of you that were here last Wednesday, um, you know what you're in for. So, uh, and those that haven't been, I'd like to tell you, uh, we are, you're in for a surprise, right? We have my friend, Chaplain Michael Langdon, who is here tonight to speak. This is the second part of his series. If you have not, if you weren't here last week, it's on YouTube. Please check it out. It's a lot of really good information and... Just everything we're going to be learning, he's got three more sessions after this. It's, I tell you, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. You know, being a fellow uh, military man, knowing the kind of things that we're dealing with in the world, and also teaching high schoolers. I mean, the kind of stuff that they are dealing with and the, what society is pressuring them. Just all the different thoughts and ideas, and, and it's absolutely crazy. So just to be able to sit in and, and see the facts and see them presented in this way. So I'm very glad that you are all here tonight. So would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Chaplain Michael Langdon. All right. Just when you thought it was safe to come back to chapel, here I am again. Uh, as I said, I'm Michael Langdon, and uh, I appreciate the welcoming spirit that I've received at this church, this chapel. Uh, I've been to a lot of churches that are all stuffy and tight, and they pretend to be nice, but uh, you know, this place really has welcomed me with open arms, and I appreciate that. Just wanted to tell you that. Okay, my name is Michael Langdon, and I was trained by Dr. Kent Hovind to be a creation science evangelist. If you missed it last week, I talked about the Big Bang, which is actually a big dud. It didn't happen. It's a ridiculous theory that violates numerous laws of science. It would have been discarded long ago if there was another option other than special creation. Well, this week I want to change gears and talk about the age of the earth. Because the Bible says, in the beginning, question, when was the beginning? How old is this earth? I don't think most Christians truly appreciate just how important this question really is. But the Bible says, for by him, speaking of Jesus, were all things created. And Jesus said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And Adam was the first man. Well, if Adam was the first man and he was here in the beginning, we should be able to get a rough estimate as to how old the earth is simply by adding up the ages of the patriarchs. And if you add up the ages of the patriarchs, leading all the way back to Adam, the dates add up to roughly 4,000 B.C., or 6,000 years and some change from the beginning of the creation. Well, we have a conflict here. Because our children's public school textbooks say the earth is billions of years old. Now, Congress may not know it, but there's a difference between thousands and billions. Somebody is really wrong about their estimation for the age of this earth. And tonight, I'm going to show you who it is. But our children are bombarded with this propaganda. Billions of years ago, millions of years, billions of years. We even have some Christians going around saying the earth is billions of years old and that God used evolution to get us here. They believe in what's commonly called the gap theory or the day-age theory. How many of you have ever heard of the gap theory or the day-age theory before? Back in the mid-1800s, Christians began to panic because they thought that science had proven the great age of the earth. And they said, oh man, now we need to find a way to, to twist this and make the Bible fit this. 
So between the creation days, they came up with time spans of billions of years. Well, there are some significant issues with this theory. Because on day three, God made the plants, the trees, the vegetation. On day four, he created the sun. See where I'm going with this? Now, if those days are really time spans of billions of years, that's going to be kind of hard on those plants waiting for the sun to come up, don't you think? And what about the insects? They weren't made until day six, and they pollinate the plants. And what about the Jews? Were they supposed to work for six million years and then finally take a break? <laughs> now, the days of creation are exactly the same as we have today, and don't let any guru try to tell you differently. But who really cares about the age of the earth? I mean, is it really that big a deal? Is it really that big an issue? Well, number one, the credibility of the book of Genesis is at stake. The book of Genesis is the very base upon which the rest of our Bible stands. If you take out the base, the rest will come crashing down, no problem. The credibility of Jesus is at stake. He cited from Genesis 25 times by my count. That's just what's recorded in Scripture. Actually, the whole Bible is at stake. Nearly every other book in the Bible refers back to Genesis. So if, the book, if Genesis is wrong, the whole Bible is wrong. Number four, this is a big one, the old earth view puts death before sin. See, the Bible teaches that God created a perfect world. No suffering, no pain, no death. But then by man came death, in Adam all die. God created a perfect world, and Adam messed it up with his own original sin. By the way, if there was no original sin that brought death into the world, speaking of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden taken to the forbidden fruit, if there was no original sin that brought death into the world, that means we have no need for a Savior, which means Jesus died for nothing. If you play it out to its logical conclusion, the old earth view, the death before sin view, is ultimately rooted in heresy. Number five, the evolutionists care about the age of the earth because their theory looks extremely silly without billions of years to hide in. If it could be demonstrated that the earth is not billions of years old, but only thousands, then creation wins first round knockout. I'll show you. If I told you that if you kissed a frog, it'll turn to a handsome prince, you'd say, wait a minute, Chaplain Langdon. Frogs do not turn into princes, okay? That's a fairy tale. Okay. Well, what if I told you that exact same fairy tale is being taught to our children at your tax dollar expense? But instead of a kiss from a beautiful princess, oh, no, 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 no. Now we have a new super-duper high-powered magic ingredient called billions and billions of years. Same fairy tale, different magic ingredient. Some of you young people, when you go off to college and your professor says, millions of years ago, raise your hand and say, excuse me, professor, were you there? He'll say, no, of course I wasn't there then you can say, now, Professor, do you know the universe is billions of years old, or do you believe the universe is billions of years old? You see, science means knowledge, knowledge gained by observation or experimentation. So you can believe the earth is billions of years old, but that's not science. That is part of their pagan religion. Now, quick history lesson. In 1830, a Scottish lawyer named Charles Lyell wrote this book, Principles of Geology. By the way, Lyle had zero science training, neither did Darwin, by the way. But all throughout his book is this obvious mocking of God's word. He said in, on page 41, the interest of religion as well as those of sound philosophy. In other words, if you believe the Bible, you're stupid. He said accusations founded on religious prejudices. Lyle said his goal was to free the science from Moses. He said on page 302, men of superior talent he was referring to himself, who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority. He was talking about the Bible. And young people understand my, my position on this. When you get out of high school, go to college. Get a good career, make something of yourself, and, and contribute something back into society. But be forewarned, 
When you go to college, it is not going to take you long to find two or three professors that want you to think that way, that think exactly just like that. They think it's their goal to ruin your faith in God's Word. I remember the first time I spoke on creation and evolution. It was up in Minnesota, and of an evolution professor was in the crowd that night. The reason he came that night was because some Christian students in his class heard that I was speaking on this issue, so they invited him to come to listen to me speak. So he came that night with several of his students to try to discredit me. So he walks up to me and he says, I have a question. All the students are behind him. He says, which contradictory version of creation do you believe? Because I'd said that I believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of the living God. He says, which contradictory version of creation do you believe? Real smug look on his face. I wanted to slap the taste out of his mouth. In Christian love, of course. So I look and I say, why, professor, whatever do you mean? Because I knew exactly where this jackal was going. I knew, I've heard this one a thousand times. These guys think they're so clever. He looks at me and says, let me show you. He says, Genesis chapter 1 says the trees were made on day 3. Genesis chapter 2 says the trees were made on day 6. Genesis chapter 1 says the birds were made out of the water on day 5. Genesis chapter 2 says the birds were made out of the ground on day 6. Genesis chapter 1 says the animals were made before man. Genesis chapter 2 says the animals were made after man. So which contra contradictory version of creation do you believe? I said, well, I believe in both. He said, they contradict each other. I said, Professor, let me show you and your students exactly what you're missing. This is the sequence of events. This is how God did it. On day three, God made the trees. On day five, he made the birds out of the water. And, and on day six, God made the animals. Then he made man. Those are the trees and animals all around the world. But then in Genesis chapter 2, God made a garden, and he put man in it. Then he made the trees that were good for food and pleasant to look upon in the garden only. Then he made one more of each animal out of the ground so Adam could name them. So the trees and the animals mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 were only the ones in the garden only, and we're not referring to the trees and animals all over the world mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. There's no contradiction there. Genesis chapter 2 is an expansion of what happened on day 6 in the garden only. Now, as I explain this to this professor, his students are like, oh, yeah, I, I heard the professor's argument, but this explains it. You know, that makes sense. They were getting it, but this professor, he was not having it. He's like, no, 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 there's, there's two contradictory versions of creation there. I said, professor, let me explain to you and to your students exactly why you just intentionally missed my point. Actually, Peter explains it pretty well. Peter said, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. You realize there's people that scoff at the Bible? I deal with them all the time. It says they're going to walk after their own lust. You see, the reason they scoff is not because of their science, it's because of their sin. And for this, they are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. <laughs> and the reason this professor did not want to accept my opinion is not because I didn't explain it, it's because he doesn't like the Bible because it chaps his hide. That's why I told him he better get a whole bunch of Vaseline because he's going to need it. Because whether he likes it or he doesn't like it, we are all going to be judged according to that book. But I guarantee that same professor used the exact same argument in front of Christian students in his class, and it worked. Because these untrained Christian students go to his class and listen to these people, and they walk out thinking, man, my professor just proved that the Bible has errors and flaws and contradictions in it. Did you know that three out of four children raised in Christian homes who attend public schools will lose faith in the Bible by their first year of college? Three out of four. And I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating. If you weaken the faith of a Christian student, you need to carefully read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones, but which believe in me, it were better for him than a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. 
Anyone who weakens the faith of a Christian student is in serious trouble when they stand before God. And I'm not looking to pick a fight with these professors. I get accused of that a lot. Oh, you're just trying to make these professors look foolish. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to win them to the Lord before they die and go to hell. And former evolution professors make great allies to the creation cause. But until then, it's the Lord's will for us to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. But these men are not the enemy, but they do work for them. And I'm just trying to clean up a mess. Anyway, getting back to Lyle. In the early 1800s, Lyle created what we call today the geologic column. Who here has ever heard of the geologic column before? See, the earth has layers in it. And Lyle convinced the scientific community that each of these layers is millions of years older than the layer above it. And he put it all nice and neat in the geologic time frame. And here we see the Jurassic layer. It's supposed to be 150 million years old, you know, from the, the movie Jurassic Park. Then you got uh, the Cambrian layer. Uh, it's supposed to be 450 million years old. Now, Darwin did not like round numbers. Darwin said the welding deposits in England were 300, or 306,662,400 years old. Where he came up with that number, your guess is as good as mine. The only thing I know with absolute certainty is this whole thing is baloney. This is a picture of a petrified tree running through multiple rock layers. These polystrata fossils, as they're called, are a very common feature found all over the world. And they put the evolutionist who believe that these layers are separated by millions of years in a very embarrassing position. Because they can either say that the tree stood there for millions of years and did not rot, while the layers slowly grew around them. Or they can say that the tree grew through 20 feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. There's a third choice. Those trees were buried in a cataclysmic worldwide flood. Sometimes the trees are upside down running through multiple rock layers. Now the evolutionists really have a problem. Did the tree stand on its head for millions of years while the layers slowly grew around it? I find that very difficult to believe. Now, there is no question that the earth has layers. The question is, how did they get that way? Is they, they're a better scientific way of figuring out how those layers formed. Well, if you take different kinds of dirt and you mix it in with water, the heavier layers go to the bottom and the lighter ones stack neatly on top. It's called hydrologic sorting. And if you get enough dirt and enough water, the, the, it'll petrify like this slick rock formation in Arizona. Well, back in 1980, Mount St. Helens blew its top, and tons of scalding hot mud came down the side of a mountain and cut a trench 1,000 feet wide and 140 feet deep. Then the Toodle Dam overflowed and flooded the trench that was cut out. As soon as that water went down, the sides were stratified, like a miniature Grand Canyon. Now, I know any day now, some brilliant college professor is going to bring his class down in that canyon and say, hey, boys and girls, you see this layer here? This took millions of years. No, teacher, it all formed in 1980. I was formed before that layer was formed. <laughs> but folks, when you see layers like in the Grand Canyon like this, that's not proof of billions of years. That's proof of billions of tons of water flooding this earth. God judged this world once, and guess what? He's going to do it again. So you better get saved and get ready for it. Now, not only did Lyle give each layer of rock a name and an age, he also gave it an index fossil. Basically, what he's saying, the different types of bones that we find in the dirt indicate what type of layer it is. So if you find swimming dinosaur bones in a layer, you could assume that that was the Jurassic layer from 150 million years ago. If you found trilobite fossils in a layer, you could assume that came from the Cambrian layer 450 million years ago. It sounds good, but it's not. Dr. Hovind was telling me about a time that he visited the School of Mines Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota. And the first place that the tour guide came was the geologic time scale. It's all lit up. It's under glass. You know, nobody can touch it. It's like the Ark of the Covenant. And the, the curator said, now folks, this layer here is 70 million years old. They always use that sanctimonious voice, 70 million years old. Well, Dr. Hovind's daughter was 12 years old at the time. 
She raises her hand and says, excuse me, sir, how do you know the age of that layer? He said, that's a good question, honey. We know the age of the layer, the types of fossils we find in them. They're called index fossils. She said, thank you, sir. Well, then they went around the corner and the guy said, now folks, these bones here are 100 million years old. Dr. Hoban's daughter raised her hand again. She said, excuse me, sir, how do you know the age of those bones? He said, well, we need to know the age of the bones by what layer we find them in. Did you follow that? She said, sir, when we were standing over here, you said you knew the age of the layers by the bones. Now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? That guy had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. Circular reasoning and the geologic column are hand and glove. Here's a textbook where on page 306, they date the rock by the fossil. On page 307, they date the fossil by the rock. And somehow they just don't get it. Here's some quotes from, from some brand name evolutionists. Are the authorities maintaining on the one hand that evolution is documented by geology and on the other, that geology is documented by evolution? Isn't this a circular argument? Look at the name of the article. Bio, or biologist, help. I'm trying to help him. Nobody wants to listen to me. How about this one? The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. Try to figure that one out. But don't let them get that circular reasoning past you. Now, you people are going to be told that it takes millions of years for things to petrify. Petrified actu petrification actually takes very little time and a whole lot to do with weight and pressure. It's commonly believed that petrification is a process taking millions of years. Not true. Under ideal conditions, petrification can take place in as few as three weeks. You're looking at parts of petrified flour sacks from the Blue Spring Mill. That's a petrified bag of flour. Evolutionists will say, well, that just means some caveman was making pancakes. <laughs> Here's petrified firewood with chop marks on it. I doubt they started chopping on it after it turned to stone. Stone doesn't burn that well, just, just so you know. Here's a petrified bowler's hat. Evolution will say, that just means some caveman was wearing a hat when he went bowling. Here's a petrified pickle. Don't bite it. Unless you have a really good dentist. Here's a picture of a petrified fish giving birth. It doesn't take millions of years to give birth. I bet you women are happy about that. Here's a petrified fish eating another fish. Or the little one's a dentist. Here's a picture of a petrified cowboy boot with the leg still in it. Apparently a cowboy got in a fight with some Indians and lost his leg. They even wrote a song about that. It's called the Limestone Cowboy. That's all the singing I'm going to do, so don't leave. The textbooks say that coal formed 250 million years ago in the Carboniferous era. I don't think so. Newt Anderson found this bell inside a lump of coal. It was supposed to be 290 million years old. Now, ancient man was, supposed, was allegedly uh, didn't come on the scene for, until about 3 million years ago. Here we have an advanced human artifact in a lump of coal that's supposed to be 300 million years old. This steel hammer was found in a layer supposed to be 400 million years old. Evolutionists will say that just means some caveman was a carpenter, like Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Oh, oh, oh. This cast iron pot was found inside a lump of coal in Thomas, Oklahoma. People say, did they have iron before the flood? They sure did. Tubal Cain was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. Genesis chapter 4. Flood happened Genesis chapter 7. In 1880, J.D. Whitney, the state geologist of California, published a lengthy review of advanced stone tools found in California gold mines underneath thick, undisturbed layers of lava ranging from 9 to 55 million years old. Now, watch this evolutionist respond to it. W.H. Holmes of the Smithsonian Institution wrote, Perhaps if Professor Whitney had fully appreciated the story of human evolution as it is understood today, he would have hesitated to announce the conclusions. What's he saying here? He's not saying he's wrong. 
He's saying, if you find evidence that goes against our theory, don't tell anyone. Or you're going to expose just how dumb our theory is. Another way they try to, to give the great age of the earth is through ice ring dating. These guys in Denver, they dig holes in the ice and they bring up the core and then they count the layers. Dark light, dark light, dark light. How would you like to have an exciting job like that? Counting ice ring layers. There you see our tax dollars at work, folks. Now, as the theory goes, in the summer, a top layer of snow melts and refreezes as clear ice. In the winter, the snow packs and shows up as a dark layer. And there you see summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. This textbook says, these annual rings are very thin. The deepest cores can measure around 10,000 feet. Cores from Greenland drilled since 1990 indicate an age of 135,000 years. Well, whoever wrote for these textbooks obviously has never heard of the Lost Squadron. How many of you history buffs have ever heard about the Lost Squadron before? During World War II, some fighter planes went off course and ran out of gas and crash-landed in Greenland. Well, the pilots were all rescued, but they had to leave the planes there. They went on, fought the war, and forgot about the planes for half a century. Then in 1990, a guy named Bob Carden had a great idea. He said, you know what? Let's go to these planes and gas them up, brush the snow off the wings, and fly them home. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. When they got there, they had to use ground-penetrating radar just to locate the planes. The Lost Squadron was covered by 263 feet of ice in 48 years. They had to drill holes through the ice just to get down to the planes, then under the ice, they had to disassemble them and bring them up through the holes, and they put them back together in Bob Card's museum in Middleborough, Kentucky. You can read all about it at thelostsquadron.com. Now, in April of 99, Dr. Hove had visited Bob Card at his museum in Middleborough, Kentucky. He asked him the question. He said, Bob, when you guys were drilling holes down to the plains, did you see ice rings? Cardin said, yeah, thousands of them. You can see them right here. Hoban said, how do you explain the fact that they have thousands of annual rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be more like 48? Cardin said, those aren't annual rings. Those rings don't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. They represent warm, cold, warm, cold. That happens between noon and midnight each day. <laughs> those are not annual rings. Those are daily rings. But they're still presented in our kids' textbooks as annual rings. People say, well, what about carbon dating? Carbon dating is the, uh, the end-all uh, close argument straight up. Well, first I'll explain how, how carbon dating is supposed to work, and then I'll explain why it doesn't. Radiation from the sun strikes the atmosphere and produces a small amount of radioactive carbon-14. During photosynthesis, plants breathe in CO2 and make it part of their tissue. Then the animals eat the plants and make it part of their bodies. And the people eat the plants, and the people uh, eat the animals that eat the plants. In any event, every organism, plant, animal, and human, have a small amount of radioactive carbon-14. Now, when the plant or animal dies, it stops taking in new carbon, and the carbon that's there starts to decay. Now, radiocarbon has a half-life of almost 6,000 years. So if something was supposed to have 20 units of carbon, and when you dug it up, it had 10, you could assume that it was dead for 6,000 years. If you dug it up and it had five units of carbon, you could assume it was dead for 12,000 years. It goes all the way up to around 30,000 years. After that, it gets really hard to measure because there's just not enough carbon left to decay. It sounds like it would work, but there are some problems with this theory too. You see, this is the empirical science. This is what we know for sure about carbon dating. We can measure how much carbon is in a fossil. We can measure that very precisely. And we can measure the current rate of decay. But these are the assumptions that throw the whole thing off. First of all, how much carbon was in the animal when it died? Not all animals eat the same amount. Number two, has the rate of decay always been the same? You know, an elephant that dies in Africa where it's hot is not going to decay at the same rate as a mammoth that dies in the Arctic and gets buried in the snow. I'll give you some examples as to how carbon-14 dating does not work. Living mollusk shells were carbon dated as being 2,300 years old. They were still alive. 
Living penguins dated as being 8,000 years old. A freshly killed seal was carbon dated at 1,300 years old. They just killed it. Shells from living snails were carbon dated as being 27,000 years old. Still alive. One part of a Vallisomic mammoth carbon dated as 29,000 years, years old, and the other part dated 44,000. Two parts from the same animal. One part of a baby frozen mammoth was 40,000, the other part was 26,000, and the wood around the carcass was 10,000. Which date is going to get published? The lower leg of a Fairbanks Creek mammoth had a radiocarbon age of 15,000 years, while its skin and flesh were 21,000. That's a slow birth. Dinosaur bones carbon dated at 34,000 years old. Uh-oh. Dinosaurs were supposed to have gone extinct millions of years ago. Why wasn't that date published? Now, potassium to argon dating has a much, they use much bigger numbers, uh, but it has the same problems as carbon dating. How much potassium was there to decay to argon, and has it always decayed at the same rate? James Dawson was the chief of engineering at the lunar division at NASA. He worked on the lunar samples, including the Genesis rock. Dr. Hoven called him up and said, James, how old is the rock? He said, we don't know. He said, we got ages ranging from 10,000 years to several billion from the same rock. He said, how old would you like it to be? In the last two years, an absolute date has been obtained from the Nandong beds and has a very interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. That is an interesting value. That's a 100% margin for error. Not exactly an exact science. Now, the KBS Tuft was dated using potassium argon dating at 212 to 230 million years old. Many people studied this tuft, and that was the age that was agreed upon. Until Richard Leakey found a perfectly normal human skull underneath the KBS tuft. Now, if ancient man was not even supposed to come on the scene until 3 million years ago, and here we have this tuft being dated at being 230 million years old, so they had to redate it until it came to 2.9 million years old. You can read all about it in this book, Bones of Contention by Marvin Luvenal. But these are the things to consider about radiometric dating. When dating samples of known age, dating does not work. When dating samples of unknown age, dating is assumed to work. In 1770, George Buffon said the Earth was 70,000 years old. By 1905, the official age of the Earth was 2 billion. Man, what happened in that 135 years? Is anybody here alive when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon? You people are real old. Because when Armstrong landed on the moon, the Earth was 3.5 billion years old. Today, it's 4.6. You guys are over a billion years old. You look good for your age. That means the Earth has been getting older at a rate of 21 million years per year or 40 years per minute. Since I started this presentation, 1,200 years have gone by. Where does the time go? <laughs> Bible's always said 4,004 B.C. That's our story, and we're sticking with it. Now, but there's actually numerous scientific ways to show that the universe is not billions of years old. For instance, this article from 1999, last weekend, the world's population topped 6 billion. Now, in 1985, there was 5 billion people on Earth. In 1810, there was 1 billion. So the human population level is growing rapidly. But the earth is not overcrowded. Don't fall for that overcrowded propaganda that they're trying to sell. They're trying to justify abortion is what they're doing. I've been in the military. I've been all around the world. And there are times where I've been trolling through Iraq or Afghanistan or even Montana. And there's times where I'd look around and it was, it was as if I was the only person in the whole world. Folks, if it's overcrowded where you are, move. <laughs> you don't have to live in Los Angeles or New York City. There's plenty of room out there. But during the time of Christ, there was a quarter of a billion people on this earth. You see, the population growth curve looks like it started around 4,400 years ago when eight people got off Noah's Ark. If you have eight people having kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, 
you can get a population of 6 billion in less than 5,000 years. Now, if you believe that ancient man came on the earth 3 million years ago, do you realize what the population level would be today? There would be 150,000 people per square inch. That would be overcrowded. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. He says he numbers the stars and knows them all by name. That really is an amazing thing, because it's been estimated that there are enough stars for every person on earth to have 11 trillion of them to themselves. Those are the ones that we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> but imagine trying to name and number every single star in the universe. My Heavenly Father did it. He's pretty smart, isn't he? But I got a question. Astronomers have observed that about every 30 years, a star dies and explodes into a supernova. So if the Earth is billions of years old, then why are there less than 300 supernovas? There should be hundreds of millions of them. Are the stars wrong or is the evolution theory wrong? Did you know that as the moon goes around the Earth, it gradually gets further away? We're slowly losing our moon. Now, it's nothing to worry about, plus nothing you can do about it anyway. But each year, the, Earth is, or the moon is getting further away. So that means that it used to be closer. I bet you didn't know that. Now, if the universe is six or 7,000 years old, that's no big deal. The moon was this close, now it's this close. However, evolutionists say the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, yet one billion years ago, the moon would have been less than 50 feet from the Earth, which explains what happened to the tall dinosaurs. They got moon. Speaking of the moon, did you know that there's dust flying around in outer space? But when it lands on the moon, it just stacks higher and higher. Here on Earth, it gets washed away through wind and rain. When it lands on the moon, it just accumulates. Here's a kid's book from 1959, 10 years before we landed on the moon. The moon does not, like, does not look like Earth at all. There are no trees, no lakes, no water at all. There's just deep gray dust, 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 dust. Well, the moon, the dust accumulation issue was of major concern to the evolutionist at NASA because moon dust accumulates at a rate of 2.7 inches per million years or 1,033 feet in 4.6 billion years. Isaac Asimov, the Russian astronomer, said, I get a picture, therefore, of the, nice, of the first spaceship packing out a nice level place for landing purposes, coming in slowly downward tail first and sinking majestically out of sight because of the great age of accumulation of all the dust. So these brilliant evolutionists at NASA uh, put landing pads added to the lunar landing module and the legs lengthened. They wanted to give it the snowshoe effect because they thought he was gonna sink down into the dust. When Armstrong finally landed, the ladder was 18 inches too short. He was afraid of jumping down in fear of tearing his suit. You don't wanna get a tear in your suit out there in outer space. But when he finally jumped down, he said, hey fellas, Where's all the dust? Actually, he's saluting old glory. The evolutionists didn't say it, but I know they were thinking it. They were thinking, I bet the Christians went up there and cleaned it all up just to make us look stupid. <laughs> no, you don't need our help to look stupid. No, you're doing fine. Did you know that there's comets flying around in outer space? But as they fly through the air, they're constantly losing material. Comets have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years. You just can't keep losing and losing and losing. After a while, it's gone, kind of like your checkbook. <laughs> but if the universe is billions of years old, then why do we still have comets? Well, a guy tried to tackle this. His name was Matson. He's got a website out. He said in the 1950s, the Dutch astronomer Jan Oort proposed, which means he hoped, he wished, he prayed, that a great spherical shell of comets existed at the remote frontiers of our solar system. You know, and pieces are just breaking off every 10,000 years or so. Matson said, better statistics in more recent years have supported the existence of the Oort cloud and put it at a distance of 50,000 astronomical units away. 
Well, in case you didn't know, an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, or 93 million miles. Now, Pluto is 39 astronomical units away. And you can't see Pluto without a telescope that's about half the size of this room. You see the problem? No one has ever seen the Oort cloud. Oort never saw the Oort cloud. It's based upon imagination. But Madsen said, sorry, fellas, but if you want to use this comet argument, it's up to you to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. Let me stop right there. How do you prove the non-existence of something? Where would you start? Suppose I said, it's a scientific fact that watermelons are blue inside until you cut the skin. Prove I'm wrong. This is a technique that lawyers and politicians do. It's called shifting the burden of proof. And if Matson wants to use this, this Oort cloud, he needs to prove that it does exist. That is the way real science works. Did you know the sun is losing 5 million tons of matter a second? It's on a serious weight loss program. Well, if you go back in time, that means the sun used to be bigger. Now, since 1836, more than 100 different observers at the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest that the sun's diameter is shrinking at a rate of 0.1% each century, or about 5 feet per hour. Now, if the universe is six or 7,000 years old, that's no big deal. The Earth may have been a few degrees hotter. No big deal. However, 11 million years ago, the sun would have been touching the Earth, which explains what happened to the dinosaurs. They became brontosaurus burgers for Fred and Barney. Job said, speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. Is, this, is Job saying that, that the earth can give us clues as to how old it is? Did you know the earth is spinning over 1,000 miles an hour at the equator? But in 1990, they had to add one second to the clock because Earth's rotation is slowing down. Time to kill. Earth's rotation is slowing down. To compensate for this lagging motion, June will be one second longer, or will be one, will be one second longer than normal. We will have a leap second. Now, you've probably heard of leap year, but not many people have heard of leap second. But did you know that we have a leap second every 18 months because Earth's rotation is slowing down? Now, follow me on this. The Earth is spinning, but it is slowing down. That means that it used to be spinning faster. Now, if the Earth is six or 7,000 years old, that's really no big deal. Instead of a 24-hour day, Adam had a 23, 23 and a half hour day. But if you believe the Earth is billions of years old, ooh, you got a problem. Your days and nights, you know, billions of years ago, this earth would have been spinning real fast. Your days and nights would be real quick. Get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. And the winds would have been spinning 5,000 miles an hour because of the Coriolis effect. And dinosaurs were supposed to live 150 million years ago. I know what happened to them. <laughs> I'll be discussing dinosaurs in seminar part five. You don't want to miss that one. That's everybody's favorite. Did you know that oil, that sometimes when they dig into the ground, they hit oil that's under amazing pressure? Up to 20,000 pounds per square inch. Now, the rock can only hold this type of pressure for less than 10,000 years. So I have two questions. Where did the oil come from, and why is it still under pressure? Well, it's a scientific fact that oil is made from organisms that are crushed, but it does not take millions of years. In Australia, a factory made oil from sewage sludge in less than 30 minutes. Now, it's extremely painstaking and expensive, but it can be done. The Sinclair Oil Company has the dinosaur as their logo. They say dinosaurs have been turning to oil over millions of years. I don't think so. I believe that 4,400 years ago, there was a flood which destroyed this earth. In this flood, dinosaurs, other animals, and people all drowned and turned to oil. So if you stop and think about it, you drove over here today on some of your ancestors. <laughs> Next time you're at the gas station pumping them in there, say, bye, Grandpa. You should have listened to Noah. He told you it was going to rain. 
Speaking of rain, did you know that when it rains, 30% of the water runs into the ocean, bringing with it mineral salt? And today, the oceans are 3.6% salt. That could have been done in less than 5,000 years. Dr. Hoven was in a, a debate with an evolutionist. And he said, now, Dr. Hoven, during the flood of Noah, how did the freshwater fish survive? And Hoven said, well, I believe during the flood of Noah that the oceans are getting saltier every day. So during the flood of Noah, I believe it was all fresh water. And today, many animals have had to adapt to fresh water and salt water. And today, we have freshwater crocodiles and we have saltwater crocodiles. And they had a common ancestor, a crocodile. The evolutionist got all excited. He said, well, that's evolution. He said, no, professor, that's microevolution. You see, changing from a freshwater croc to a saltwater croc is a minor change compared to the evolution myth. They believe a rock changed to a croc. That would be a major change. Speaking of rocks, how many of you have ever been in cave exploring and you came to a sign that said, don't touch the stalactites, they take millions of years to form? They say it takes a thousand years to grow one inch. I don't think so. Here's two inch stalactites growing off a, a refrigeration shed in Pensacola, Florida. <laughs> that shed was not 2,000 years old, by the way. Here's 50 inch stalactites growing underneath the Lincoln Memorial. They built in 1922. I know that seems like a long time ago, but trust me, that's a stretch from 50,000 years. There's a tourist attraction in Wyoming called the Teepee Fountain. In 1903, a guy had a spring bubbling out of his yard. So he put a, a pipe in it and made the water go up the pipe and it came down the side and left behind mineral deposits. You know what mineral deposits are? If you don't clean your utility sink for a while, it starts to develop mineral deposits and, and gets bigger. Well, here's the Teepee Fountain 90 years later. That would take a little bit of lime away, wouldn't, don't you think? Might take the whole bottle. But don't let people tell you that it takes millions of years for these things to form. Under the right conditions, they can form very rapidly. But here's some points to ponder. If the earth is billions of years old, then why do the first fully developed systems of writing appear only 5,000 years ago? Why is the oldest language that can reasonably be reconstructed already modern, sophisticated, and complete from an evolutionary point of view? Why does the Chinese calendar say that the year 2004 was 4,700? Maybe they started with the flood. Why does the Hebrew calendar say that 2004 was the year 5770? Maybe they started with creation. Why are the oldest reliable historical records around 5,000 years old? Final question. Why aren't students shown the evidence of the universe being young? Folks, the evidence that the earth is young and that the Bible is true is overwhelming, but our children are being brainwashed to believe the opposite. The same thing happened to Crawford Toy. Crawford Toy was a great Southern Baptist seminary professor in 1876. He almost married Lottie Moon, the famous Southern Baptist missionary to China. Professor Toy wrote Miss Moon proposing marriage and suggesting mission work together in Japan. Following the Civil War, he studied in Europe, where he was exposed to Darwinian theory and to new ideas of the German scholars on Old Testament history and inspiration. Her conclusion was that evolution was for her an untenable position and espouses theory that do not square with God's word. Good call, Lottie. Rejecting Toy's proposal, Miss Moon said, my cross is loneliness. Well, Lottie, I for one just want to tell you that I appreciate your integrity and your unwillingness to compromise with the clear teaching of Scripture. Now, Crawford Toy said, the Bible intends to teach a plain six-day creation. Yep, it sure does. The Bible is simply in error at that point. Ooh, the Bible's in error? Crawford, maybe your theory's in error. Maybe you've been brainwashed, Crawford. Now, folks, I know some old earth Christians who love the Lord Jesus Christ just as much as I do, but there's no getting around it. That is what we call a compromise. Moses was asked to make a compromise. 
I'm sure you remember the story from Exodus. God commanded Moses to command Pharaoh to release the Hebrew slaves. Pharaoh said, it's not going to happen. Moses said, we'll see about that. After a few plagues, Pharaoh calls Moses back again. He says, Moses, I'll tell you what. Your old can leave, but your young have to stay here in Egypt. And there's a whole sermon behind that. The devil's after our kids. But Moses looked at Pharaoh and said, no deal. After a few more plagues, Pharaoh called Moses back again. He said, Mo, I'll tell you what. Your old and your young can leave, but your cattle have to stay here in Egypt. And I love Moses' bold response. Moses looks at Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth, and says, not a hoof shall be left behind. Moses said, Pharaoh, you just don't get it, do you? I'm not here to play, let's make a deal. Pharaoh, you don't get our young, you don't get our old, you don't even get our animals. Pharaoh, you get nothing. There will be no compromise. Well, in the mid-1800s, the Christians were asked to make a compromise. All the humanists wanted was Genesis chapter 1, just the first chapter in the Bible. And the Christians gave it to them on a silver platter. Folks, as I said before, Genesis chapter 1, that is the base upon which the rest of our Bible stands. And if you want to uh, tear down a, a structure, you don't have to plant bombs all over. You plant bombs at the base and the rest will come crashing down, no problem. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. Get on or get off. Pick a team and play. You cannot compromise God's truth with the devil's lie. Someone is wrong. All my life I believed in the lie of evolution, that there was no God nor consequences for my actions. Then I came to prison, and creation science led me to the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Quote Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer cannibal. You'll be amazed at what faces you'll see in heaven and what faces you won't see in heaven. If creation is true, there's a creator, obviously. If evolution is true, there is no creator. If creation is true, there are rules, right and wrong. They're called the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. If evolution is true, there are no rules. Make them up as you go. If creation is true, there's a purpose to life. You are on this earth for a reason. If evolution is true, there is no purpose to life. You're nothing but a cosmic accident. So you may as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. For tomorrow you die. If creation is true, there's comfort in knowing the future. All this hoopla about North Korea, relax, God's got everything under control. If evolution is true, there is no hope for knowing the future. By the way, we're moving 67,000 miles an hour around the sun and nobody's driving. <laughs> you ever seen that twilight zone where the, the earth was getting closer to the sun? If there is no God, what's to stop that from happening? If creation is true, man brought death into the world and death is a terrible thing. It's a curse. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. And death is a wonderful thing because it's how we get ahead. One species or one race evolves past the rest, and the rest have to die. If evolution is true, Adolf Hitler was right. If creation is true, there's an afterlife. You can have the hope of heaven when you, when you die. If evolution is true, there is no afterlife. You're going to be recycled into a plant or an earthworm. If creation is true, man is a fallen creature in need of a savior. If evolution is true, man is evolving with no need for a savior. Now, shortly before the eruption of Mount St. Helens, Tim Barons of KJSL Radio, St. Louis, witnessed to Harry Truman, not the president, but this, this old guy. Tim said that Harry was a very profane man. He cursed every other word he said. He listened to the gospel message, but rejected what I had to say. He turned Jesus down. Get that Jesus stuff out of here. I don't want to hear it. A short time later, Harry was warned that Mount St. Helens was about to erupt. 
They said, Harry, you need to move. Harry said, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. Well, somebody take a wild guess at what happened a few days later. Well, Harry did stay right there. Matter of fact, he's still there. They never did find him. Unless Harry repented real fast, Harry is in hell right now. Pretty stupid, huh? He had the warnings, but he did not heed them. Well, folks, here's your warning. It is appointed unto men once to die. You are going to die. And after this comes the judgment. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you need to confess that you're a sinner, you need to repent, and finally, you need to accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as payment for your sins. And you can have the hope of heaven when you die. You want somebody to walk you through it? Come see me after the service. I'll be happy to walk you through it. Now, these deer figured out if they stand in the stream, the fire won't hurt them. Pretty smart, huh? God's judgment won't harm those who stand in Christ. Heaven or hell, the choice is yours. And if you're here today and you saw are saved, you need to go tell other people how to get saved. That's called the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. So get busy for the Lord. Now, what if I told you the moon is made of cheese? You'd say, well, that's kind of a stupid theory. You can believe it if you want. Okay. What if I said, NASA proved on a secret mission, June 3rd, 1972? Ooh, Houston, now we have a problem. You see, if you want to make up your own ridiculous theory and believe it, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. But if you want to use tax-funded lies to support that theory, now that's a problem. Now, 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul told young Timothy to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have error concerning the faith. What's Paul telling young Timothy here? Is Paul suggesting that in the end times, people would use false scientific evidence in order to promote an anti-Christian theory? That's what I want to talk about next week. Lies in the textbooks. False information been proven wrong a long time ago used as phony evidence for evolution and designed to weaken your children's faith in God's Word. That's next week. That's all I have for this week. If you have any questions, come see me after the service. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Also, if you know of another place where I can speak on creation and evolution, please come let me know. I'm always looking for new places to speak on this issue. Thank you so much. God bless. I absolutely love it. <laughs> so I think only people here in the front um, may have realized, you know, Michael's not perfect. And sometimes his phone does go off while he's teaching up here. Um, and if you're up front, you might have heard the Terminator theme song go off. The dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I mean, he, he's up here terminating those arguments. I love it. So, but I would encourage all of you, um, how much can you really remember from all this? We will have the YouTube video up and ready. Guys, if nothing else, go back through. Find, an argument, find something there that you can hold on to. You know, if nothing else, have the link to the video. If somebody just doesn't get it, give it to them, right? This is an excellent resource to have for those that just, they're all over the place. They don't know what they believe. They've just heard all the lies. They've heard all this stuff, and they haven't heard the truth. So please use this as a resource. I would encourage you. Let's go ahead and stand. Let me invite the worship team to come up. And let's pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you so much. God, that, that once again, Lord, we, we have that faith in you, God. Lord, but Lord, just as your word declares that creation, God, it declares your glory. God, we can look at the facts, we can look at the science, and we can know 
God, not just that you're real, God, but you love us, that you care, God. And we can, it, it all declares, God, how awesome you are. Lord, we thank you for tonight, God. We thank you for the truth in your word, God, and the truth in your world. God, we glorify you tonight. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.